reason John Dickinson is not a household name is really only because he refused to sign the Declaration of Independence. But Dickinson actually fulfilled a vitally important role. He had a vision for the country that nobody else had yet, a unified people with a constitution that would be amendable so that we would never need a revolution again. Dickinson has a message for us that is one of cohesion, unity, peace, civil discourse, not just about our institutions, but also in how we discourse with one another. These are lessons that we can learn today. John Dickinson was born in Talbot County on Maryland's eastern shore on November 2nd, 1732. His father, Samuel Dickinson, was a wealthy landowner, lawyer, and judge. Samuel was in the third generation of a family of tobacco planters who, with the help of slave labor, grew a prosperous business. Following the death of his first wife, Samuel remarried and had two sons, John and Philemon. In 1740, he and his wife Mary moved their family to Kent County, Delaware. It was here, at the Jones Neck Plantation adjacent to the river, that young John grew up. John Dickinson's ancestors came over initially as indentured servants on his father's side. And this is a testimony to what could be done in America, that a man could come over with nothing, having purchased his passage on credit, come over and then worked that credit off, and then gotten some land of his own, and then his son, his grandson, great-grandson, were able to accumulate more land and more property until John Dickinson was born, and he inherited a large amount of land where he had multiple dwellings in Philadelphia and in Delaware. During his boyhood years, John would form a strong attachment to the wheat fields, rivers, and marshes of the family farm known as Home Place. Here in this serene setting, John received early training from his father. At the proper age, a formal tutor made visits to Home Place to provide young Dickinson with the kind of classical education that would serve as a great resource to him in later years. Like other young men of his social standing, John was sent abroad to study law. He sailed to England in 1753 and entered Middle Temple, part of the Inns of Court. Possessed of a conservative temperament and refined tastes, John used this experience to develop social connections that would last throughout his lifetime. Dickinson's time in law school was very important in a lot of ways. So he spent his, his time over there and then entered into the Delaware Assembly. He started out as just a member of the Assembly and within three months he had become Speaker of the Assembly. So a very quick rise. At the same time he began to establish a law practice in Philadelphia and made a name for himself very quickly in Philadelphia as a, a brilliant orator, very able barrister, and soon after that he entered into the Pennsylvania Assembly and immediately rose to be one of the leaders in it. It was in Philadelphia that he met and married Mary Norris. Mary was a Quaker, and her father, Isaac Norris Jr., was Speaker of the Pennsylvania Assembly. John's marriage to Mary, along with the property in Pennsylvania she brought to the Union, enabled him to strengthen his social and political ties in Philadelphia. In 1764, Dickinson opposed Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Galloway in their attempts to make Pennsylvania a royal colony. While he considered himself a loyal subject of the Crown, Dickinson was becoming increasingly concerned with the British trade and taxation policies. Soon after, Dickinson advocated for independent trade for the colonies in a pamphlet entitled The Late Regulations Respecting the British Colonies. 
The passage of the Stamp Act ignited the first sparks of the coming revolution, as citizens took to the streets to protest taxation without representation. The Stamp Act Congress convened in formal opposition to the new tax, and Dickinson was chosen to draft a Declaration of Rights and Resolves to be sent to the King of England. One of his major contributions was not necessarily in the Stamp Act with these resolutions, but he began writing pamphlets about how Americans should resist the British. And while in other parts of the colonies, people were getting restless and they were becoming violent, he was writing to promote a way of resistance that was originated by the Quakers in the 1650s, and that was civil disobedience. And if you do that, there's very little that the government can do against you. They're not gonna come after you with guns. They're going to have to change the laws. And it was probably a mixture of the civil disobedience along with the violence that was coming out of Boston. And the Stamp Act was repealed. And this was a huge moment where Americans had won their point without very much bloodshed. Shortly after that, the British decided they would pass another act, or a series of acts, it was the Townsend Acts. And when they were passed, Dickinson was immediately alarmed that nobody seemed to care. Whereas Americans had been very upset about the Stamp Act, they seemed completely complacent about the Townsend Acts. So this prompted him to write his most famous piece called The Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania. I will now tell the gentlemen what is the meaning of these letters. To convince the people of these colonies that they are at this moment exposed to the most imminent dangers, and to persuade them immediately, vigorously, and unanimously to exert themselves in the most firm but most peaceable manner for obtaining relief. The cause of liberty is a cause of too much dignity to be sullied by turbulence and tumult. Those who engage in it should breathe a sedate yet fervent spirit, animating them to actions of prudence, justice, modesty, bravery, humanity, and magnanimity. They are probably the main reason that he's called the penman of the revolution. This is an apt title in some ways. It is true that Dickinson wrote more for the American cause than any other single founder. But everything he wrote, including the farmer's letters, he wrote to prevent revolution. At this time, America was part of Britain. There was no nation, there was no sense of national identity yet. So the farmer's letters were a huge moment in Dickinson's career and also in American history. They got Americans for the first time united against Britain and standing up for their rights, really as a country for the first time. The people were united, but it also started pushing them towards revolution. It was a turning point. Another thing he did at almost exactly the same time, also in 1768, was he published what we could consider to be America's first number one hit single. It was called The Liberty Song. He wrote this to a British tune, and this was sung in every tavern across the colonies. And he was really seen as a popular idol. He was America's first political hero with this.
he was an American hero, and by the time of the first Continental Congress in the fall of 1774, Dickinson wielded more power and influence in America than probably any other single figure, and he always counseled diplomacy. I think a key turning point for Dickinson with his reputation was in July of 1775. He wrote two crucial documents that seem like they contradict each other, but they're of a piece. He wrote first the Olive Branch Petition, and this was a near final effort to appeal to the Crown to say, look, we are your subjects and please, we want this to work out. The very next day, Congress issued a declaration on taking up arms. Two drafts were written, one by Thomas Jefferson and one by John Dickinson. The one that they published was aggressive, saber-rattling, it was threatening, and it basically said, go ahead, bring it on. You come on over here, we're ready, we'll fight you. Now, most people have assumed that Thomas Jefferson wrote that draft and Dickinson wrote the one that was kind of soft and timid. It was exactly the opposite. Dickinson wrote the angry, fiery, threatening one. And his intent was to produce such apprehensions in the British that they wouldn't dare come over and try it. He really wanted to avert war any way he could.